Good morning, church. All of you are aware of the uh, disaster on uh, Maui and uh, the loss of life and uh, loss of property. I want to read you a request from the uh, Church of Christ uh, Disaster Relief Team, and I'm going to read it pretty much as it was written to us. I, I added a couple of statistics to it because we know we know more now than we did when they sent this to us. But it says, we, the Church of Christ Disaster Relief Team, have been in touch with the Maui Church of Christ. We will be helping with purchasing the following. Gasoline, generators, medical supplies, equipment, automotive repair, transportation, relocation expenses, food, clothes, and personal care items. The death toll now stands at over 100 individuals with 1,000 people still unaccounted for. There are over 3,000 structures, home, and businesses have either been destroyed or damaged by the fires. And they estimate that the loss is going to be in excess of $6 billion. It will take those folks years and years and years to recover. It says the church, the Maui church, is serving as a shelter for some and providing three meals per day, showers, laundry service. It says so many families have been affected and there are many horrific stories of survival and death. So in light of that, in uh, light of the request, the elders here at the Wiley Church have decided to team with the Church of Christ Disaster Relief Team and the Waluka Church and the Maui Church to support the relief effort in the area of Lahaina. And many of you remember the uh, Disaster Relief Team that came into Wiley back in 2015 where we helped uh, in the Rowlett uh, tornado disaster. So we have firsthand experience with uh, the, the uh, disaster relief team and they do a great job. Uh, as a church, uh, we ask that uh, if you want to be a part of a effort to support them, uh, we're going to have a special directed contribution next Sunday morning, August the 27th. Now we're not going to pass the plate uh, a second time. We're going to you know, take up our contribution and if you so desire to participate in this, you can make a check to the Wiley Church, memo it to you can write fire on the memo line, Hawaii, uh, disaster relief, uh, what, whatever, but just designate it somehow so we'll know, know where those monies go. Now this is different, it's separate from your regular contribution, and just keep in mind that we will be using uh, church funds as well to support this effort. Again, that's going to be uh, next Sunday morning, the 27th. Okay. I would ask now that you stand for prayer and remain standing for the uh, scripture reading before our lesson. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we come to you this morning just thanking you so much for what you do for us. We can never thank you enough for the blessings that you give us. We thank you, Father, for uh, the measure of health that you gave us this morning, that you gave each and every one of us the measure of health that allowed us to get out of bed, put our feet on the floor, get dressed, and, and get to God's house so that we might worship the Almighty King. Father, we thank you for that. We're blessed beyond measure here in this country. Uh, we're blessed beyond merit and, and what we receive from you. And Father, again, we thank you through your, that you allow this to happen. Father, we pray a special prayer for all those individuals that are affected by the fires in Hawaii on the island of Maui. Uh, I can't imagine. Uh, we see pictures of dev the devastation that has taken place and 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 unless we have personally experienced something like that, we just cannot imagine uh, the pain, the anguish, the fear, uh, the fear of the unknown, what's going to happen in the future. They have nothing. These people's homes, their, their schools, their places of business, their churches, uh, their places of employment are all gone. And, Father, we just pray a special prayer uh, for those folks, and uh, that, uh, though especially those that know you and that they will have that uh, patience that, pass, that passes all understanding. They'll have the courage. They'll have the endurance uh, that will get them through this. And, Father God, we know that with your help, your being by their side, they will get through this. Father, we thank you for the church here in Wiley. It's a willingness to always help. We just, uh, we're blessed, and, and we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to, to help those folks. But, Father, we pray for the church here. We, we pray that we continue to... Uh, be a beacon of light, to be that lighthouse in the community that uh, people look at us and, and want to know what's different. Why are, why are we the way we are? And we'll be able to defend our faith 
Father, we pray that each one of us in here uh, puts on that full armor and that we become warriors in your kingdom. And Father, we most of all thank you for allowing us or for you calling us children of God. Father, there's nowhere better to be than to be a child of God. And we thank you for that. Father God, we thank you for most of all for uh, Jesus and what he's done for us. We thank you for the members here at this church, the people that work behind the scenes to make things happen. We thank you for our elders and our deacons. And Father, we pray that uh, we do everything uh, prayerfully and in accordance with your will and that uh, we continue uh, to grow, that we continue to expand our boundaries, not only here in Wiley, but throughout this country and throughout the world. Father God, uh, we ask a special blessing on Steve and his family as he continues to bring the word to us. Father, we're blessed to have a man to stand up here and preach the truth and the truth only. And Father, we thank you for that. And again, a, a, a blessing on him and his family. We thank you for, uh, again, for all the men and women that work to make this church what it is. But Father God, most of all, we want to come to you this morning thanking, thanking you for Jesus. Thanking you for the sacrifice that you made in allowing your one and only son, our blessed Redeemer, to go to that cross knowing what was going to happen. Father, we thank you for Jesus and his willingness to go to that cross and his knowing what was going to happen, the fact that uh, he, he shed that blood so that we might have redemption, we might have forgiveness of sins, so that we might have salvation. And Father God, help us to have that glorious and inexpressible joy that you tell us about, that we, we know that we are saved and that we know that we will spend eternity in heaven with you. And Father God, it's through the blessed name of Jesus we ask all these things. The name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Man, I'm excited about next Sunday with that announcement because uh, one thing, if you're new to Wiley or maybe you're checking us out, one thing that you're going to need to know is that, man, this is truly a place that have get families and individuals who have given their hearts to Jesus Christ and because they have then it has turned this group of people into an extremely generous group of people and so the people in Maui our hearts go out to you the brethren there we love you and we want to show you that next week amen church amen. we want to show you that next week that we care for you immensely I'm also excited about next Sunday, too, because we're going to move into the next section of Scripture after today um, into Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, and we're going to deal with worry, and you're going to need to be back for that. So I want, you to, I want to really encourage you to be back and learn how to deal with your anxiety, because Jesus is very direct in how he instructs us in how to deal with anxiety, to how to deal with worry. And many of us even worry about our anxiety, right? And so we need, to, we need to make sure and be back for that. Until then, we're glad that you're here today. We love you. We really do appreciate you. And we want to keep growing in our faith together. And so we're glad that you're a part of this. Keep your Bibles open there, please, to Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 through 24. The Lord's going to teach us about focus the Lord's going to teach us about devotion. Here it is one more time, just so we keep wrapping our heads around it. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one, love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The context of this, if you will, look a verse up. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. What do you truly treasure in this life? We talked about that last week, and this is just part two or part B of what Jesus is trying to get us to do. And brethren, today, just like last week, just like we'll do next week, I want you to go deep in your heart. Go right down past your pride. 
go right now past your fears and really allow this lesson to be a heart examination for you and what you truly, what do you truly treasure and therefore today, what are you truly focused on? What do you truly, genuinely show your devotion to? Because it is a fact, many a man says that he loves God, but his attitude and his lifestyle reveals that he, in reality, loves wealth. Loves his stuff. This man's focus then, if that's the case, his focus and his devotion are misguided and are going to lead to a very dark life, a very dark future. So I have two questions for you this morning as we're together. Question number one, very simple questions, where's your focus? Where is your focus? Look again, please, at verses 22 and 23 as Jesus speaks about the eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So he talks about you need to have a good eye. Some translations, a healthy eye. It can be translated as have a clear eye or a pure eye. The eye is the lamp. In first century Palestine, oil lamps were used as the primary light source. How many of you have heard of Coleman lanterns? Or camp, well now it's not just Coleman lanterns. They have a whole camp. I think Walmart even carries, right? They have a whole camping outfit now where I was preaching, where we lived in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. Mr. Coleman, that's where he began. Across from the high school, there's a memorial with lamps dedicated to Mr. Coleman. And he would rent lanterns and sell oil to the homesteads around Kingfisher, Oklahoma. And that just developed and grew. People not too long ago know exactly, as a matter of fact, our guide for our little safari last week, for McKenna and I, our guide was like, you know, I grew up in the village right over here and my family still doesn't have electricity. I grew up with lamps. That's all I've known. That's all they knew. They knew exactly what Jesus was referring to. And he says the eye serves as a lamp to the body. And all they can think of is, man, it's good to have a good working lamp. It's good to have a lamp that actually has oil in it. You see, in ancient times, a good eye, they were talking about having, you have a good eye for something. It was an idiom for generosity, actually. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 9 literally says, He who has a good eye will be blessed because he gives his bread to the poor. Proverbs 22 and verse 9. The eye is usually referenced for the mind. The eye is our source of light. It perceives light which benefits the whole body and influences its movements. Praise God, you opened your eyes this morning and saw light. Oh, you'd be, see, I'd have more amens to that if you opened your eyes th this morning in complete darkness and the sun was out. You would absolutely, you, we have t totally taken our eyes for granted, haven't we? That you opened them up, they dilated right, and you went, man, I'm glad it's light out. Because we love the sun, we love light. And he says in verse 22, if the eye is clear, if the eye is healthy, clear can actually be translated as, if the eye is single. It's a word for single. Like to bring the idea of to have a single purpose or a single focus. In life. 
you ever had one of those weeks? You're just like, man, I've, been, I've just been scattered all week. No singular focus this week. All of these things coming from different directions. If your singleness of purpose, your eyes, your focus, if your singleness of purpose is pleasing to God, then you will be one who is seeking the eternal, being generous with what you have, and your spirit is going to be healthy. And then he goes on, if the eye is bad or if it's evil. If your eye is bad, you ever had a bad eye? None of us want to have a bad eye. We like to have both eyes functioning well. Many of you in this room have had eye surgery before. You had things removed from your eyes and things done to your eyes because you want to have healthy, good, clear eyes. He said, but if your eye is bad, you can have a bad eye. You can have a bad focus. You can have a bad, multi purpose instead of a singular purpose in your life if the eye is bad. Proverbs 28 and verse 22, a man with an evil eye hastens <laughs> a man with an evil eye an unhealthy eye you know what he hastens after you know what he goes fast after proverbs 28 says riches wealth and he does not consider that poverty will come upon him i've read about a lot of men and women who became extremely wealthy with earthly possessions. And they were the most poor people. They still didn't know what they were doing in this world. What God, how, why God had put them here. You see, if one is overrun with bad eyes, with a bad focus, then you're going to be greedy and envious, and your life is going to be miserable. But if we're receiving good things into our hearts, into our eyes, into our minds, then the body is going to produce good things. If we're out of focus, if we're not within our purpose, we're not going to see things as we should see things. We have two great cases of this in Scripture. One is Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 15. Luke chapter 12, the rich fool displayed this. Luke 12 and verse 15. Here's what he says. Jesus says to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And then he told them this parable. The land of the rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning with himself, what am I going to do? I have no place to store my crops. Okay, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and big, build bigger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul. All right, he's trying to talk himself into this purpose. I have many goods saved up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, be merry. But God's going to say to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God, is not focused on God. Do you not find yourself in this parable? Gaining more, building more, doing more, so that you can have more, only to leave that more behind. And God goes, I'm requiring your soul of you. I want you to be rich toward me. I want your focus to be on me. Last week we read of the other rich young man, the rich young ruler, you remember. Well, in Mark chapter 10, verse 21 and 23, because you remember, he goes, Jesus, what else do I need to do? And Jesus goes, well, you need, you need to keep the, you know what to do. You need to keep the commandments. He goes, I've been doing that. I've been doing that since I was a kid. What more is required of me? You remember what he said? Everything you own. 
sell it and give to the poor. Go help people with it. Mark 10 and verse 21. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. And he said to him, one thing that you lack, go and sell all you possess, give to the poor, and you're going to have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But at these words, he was saddened. He went away grieving for he owned a whole lot of property. His eye was bad. His eyes were bad. He sees only darkness, only the material. Because we said it last week, every treasure that you have gained on this earth is going to be stolen, eaten up, rot away. Then there's the big one. It's going to burn. It's, it's going to burn. The poor people in Maui, the, 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 reason, the reason that's so devastating is there's still stuff there. I don't know, have you seen some videos? I, I mean, I can tell the cars and I can tell the houses. I can tell what was a business. I can tell, but it's useless. There's nothing, you, you, you don't go back to that and blow the dust off and go, we'll just keep using it. That's not what you do. It's all going to be destroyed. It's all going to burn. But are you rich with God? The idea is, is your focus on God? Are you laying up treasures in heaven? Because if your focus isn't on God, if you're not rich towards God, then your life is going to be full of darkness. It's never going to be enough for you. But if you are rich towards God, your life is going to be full of light. Full of the spiritual. So it brings us to question two. Number one, what is your focus? Number two, where is your devotion? Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And I need you to notice something. He's not saying you can't have wealth. He's saying, is that your focus? Is that your devotion? Are you devoted to your wealth? He uses this term master, which reflects leadership or ownership or high position, even maybe authority. Then he uses the word slave, which would reflect total ownership of the master. Nothing to offer anyone else. You're totally owned by the master. And he goes... No one can serve two masters. Well, actually, they could. It could, in a literal sense, happen, but there was not total devotion to one. There would always be a favor toward one or the other because it can't really work right that way. And that's what he's saying to you today. You cannot, you cannot claim that you love God and come to him on a Sunday morning like this, but be totally devoted to your possessions outside of this building. That's not how this works. Either wealth is going to own you or God is going to own you. Many a man is owned by that which he thinks he owns. You must make up your mind today. What are you, devotion. What are you truly sold out to? What do you truly put your heart into? What have you given yourself over to as if you are a slave to that thing or that person? Is it stuff? Is it your career? Is it your accounts? Your savings? Or is it Jesus Christ? Because your focus de determines your devotion. And your devotion determines your true priorities in this life. One wise man said that we spend money that we don't have to buy things that we don't need to impress people we don't even like. Isn't that true? The problem is, Paul said that we've brought nothing into this world, and you need to know this for sure. You're not going to take anything with you when you die. Nothing goes with you, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 7. So again, do you own stuff or does it own you? So it's not about the amount that you're entrusted with 
well, I have more than others. I must be sold out to my wealth. It's not about the amount that you've been entrusted with. It is about have you devoted all that you are entrusted with to God? That means when it breaks down, when it goes wrong, when it's stolen, when you lose it, when you need to give it, you do it freely and gladly. You don't even own that. That's not your possession. So if I said, let's raise our hands tonight or today, how many of you own a car? No, you don't. No, you don't. Yeah, but I made payment. No, that's his money. That's your job. That is not your car. It's just not. I appreciate that you think it's your name on the title. God owns the title. He owns everything about it. The clothes that you have on your back, are, they're not yours. They're not yours. Every last penny that you have belongs to God. Every bit of it. And that's the difference. In owning stuff versus it owning me. What are you truly sold out to today? Who have you truly given your heart to today? You need to answer this question. You have to answer this question. You are responsible for answering this question. Let's pretend for just a second. Truly pretend. I have a candlelight date with another woman and you walk in and see me. Wait, who is this? Steve, where's your wife? Don't worry. I'm on a date with this beautiful woman but my wife knows that she comes first. You walk away angry and disgusted. You run and tell my wife. Of course you should. Her reaction when I get home, hey honey, hope you had a great time tonight. She gives me a kiss and then says, I don't mind you seeing other people as long as I'm most important to you. Now, why would this never happen in the minor household? Why do you think? It's because my wife refuses to share my affection with another woman. And so does Jesus. You're not going to date around on him. He's out if you do that. That's not how this works. You, you either be totally devoted out to me as your master or give yourself to everything else. And if you do, your focus is going to be wrong, your devotion is going to be wrong, and your life is going to be, oh, how great the darkness. That's what he says. How great the darkness that's going to be because you are not truly sold out to me. Christian, listen, our allegiance is only to Christ Jesus. We are foreigners in a strange land. We're sojourners just passing through. We're resident aliens. And our devotion must be Singular. He is the one. She's my one and only. He is my one and only. I don't see other people. I don't worship other gods. Your heart is not designed to show devotion to Jesus and to something else. That's why you struggle with it if you're doing it this morning. That's why your heart hurts when you come and try to sing and pray. And you need to be here. But that's why there's this struggle sometimes. If you are devoted to your career or, or your habits or your hobbies, or to travel, or to making money, or to spending money, whatever it is you're devoted to, you cannot be devoted to that and have your allegiance with Christ Jesus. It does not work that way. 
So today I wanted to do kind of a special challenge with you. I wanted to present to you four questions, four questions of devotion, of really who owns you, who is your master. If you will ask these four questions, I encourage you to take a picture of it, write them down. If, you're, if you take notes, here are the four questions. Number one, for what do you sacrifice your money for? I'm not saying what do you give a little bit to. You, you can give actually a lot and it not be a sacrifice. Hello? You, you can give money and it not be a sacrifice. Like, in other words, it doesn't hurt. What, what do you actually sacrifice your money for? Number two, when you hurt, what do you go for comfort? Do you go to something in this world? I know people who, when they're struggling and they're hurting... They go buy scratch offs. They do. You can, you can think that's weird, but some people go do the lottery. They go do scratch stuff. Some people, they go and they buy a bottle with liquid in it. And somehow, for a few minutes, it gets them out of their world. And then when they're done, their world is darker. Some people put a pill that they've gotten from a doctor into their mouth. Again, because it kind of gets them to escape something that they're hurting from. Some people go to their computer. So some people just isolate themselves and won't talk to anybody. They shut everybody out. Some people just go to deep, dark depression. Where do you go? Where do you go when you're hurting? Where do you go for comfort? Number three, what disappoints or frustrates you the most? That will reveal where your heart is. If you're frustrated the most by losing something, by not getting the raise, by not making the cut, by not getting the, the more pay, you thought there was going to be this pay and it was this pay, or not getting the benefits, or getting charged too much, it will reveal where your heart is. Number four, what really gets you excited? What gets, gets you fired up and joyful about things? Is it stuff that God's doing in your life? Is it the changes that you're making and other people are making? Is it someone becoming a Christian? The joy of sharing good news, like something that really matters to people? Or, or is it something about a ball team? It's crazy how many Christians get so worked up about a player or about a team, and they're all joyful. They're as happy. You can bring them down off of this joy and off of this high, and it lasts about six minutes, and they're down again. What a terrible, terrible life to live. I'm not saying you can't enjoy sports or even get worked up about something. I'm saying, but what really gets you going, gets you happy about things? These four things will tell you what you're devoted to. These four things will tell you what your focus is. If you're focused on the light of the world, or if you're focused on what you have and what you don't have, and what more you're trying to get. I love Jesus so much for many reasons. And one of them is because he hits me right between the eyes. Verse by verse in this sermon. And I love him so much for that because I'm going to walk away from this sermon. sermon because you know I'm listening, right? <laughs> I'm speaking it, but I'm listening. I'm listening to what the word... What, the word of the Lord is doing for me even this morning. And I'm going to walk, walk away growing from this and changed. And I love Jesus for that. That he gets down to the very core and the very center and the very heart of who I need to be about and what I need to be about. I love him so much for that. And I know you do too. That's our challenge. Who or what are you truly devoted to today and if you're not devoted to Jesus Christ maybe you were before but you're not now you need to come back to him today be a
true man of God. Be a true woman of God. Put your pride aside and come back to the one that you know you need to be fully in with. All in. I'm excited about our Legacy Family Camp. I don't know if you saw the ad through our scrolling announcements, but it'll be in the bulletin this week as well, this next week. No, this is a new week, isn't it? Today's the first day of the week. It'll be in this week's bulletin. Legacy Family Camp, we know we go for four days up to Medill, and uh, we have to cap it at 300, and we have much more that want to come. But still, if you can get in there and get registered on September 1st, you can get in, right? But I'm really excited about our theme. That's why I'm talking about this. Our theme is all in. Two words, all in. In all, and we got some great guest speakers coming, and I'm so excited because this is what I want to be. I don't want to be half in, half out. That's not what Jesus wants. That's not what God wants. He wants to have every bit of your heart. And if He doesn't have every bit of your heart today, make it right. Make it right. Whatever you need to do to make that right. And if you're not in Jesus today, you're definitely not in. You're not all in. Join us to be all in with Jesus then. Be clothed with Christ as you are baptized into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. By faith, come to him, be baptized into Christ Jesus, having your sins washed away, raised to walk in newness of life, and then go all in with him completely. If we can help you with any of that, we're a church family here to do so as we stand.